meditation doesn't happen in a vacuum. It takes place in the context of our lives. We tend to think of it as something where you pull out of your life and have time to be separate. But that's only part of the process. In other words, you have to create the proper context in your life as a whole for the meditation to have a place. This is why when the Buddha set out the factors of the path, it wasn't just right concentration or right view. It was a whole series of things, including right effort, right action, right speech. And then he set the path in a larger context as well, your social context, the people you associate with, the way you associate with them. All of this is part of the path. So we have to look at our lives to see in what ways are actually helping our practice and what ways are getting in the way. Because the practice isn't something you just stick into the cracks of your life and not expect it to make a change in your life. The Bodhi tree is a good symbol for the practice. It has very invasive roots. You plant it next to a house and it can destroy the house. It moves things around. When the practice begins to take root in your life, you begin to see that you look at things in your life in different ways. You relate to people in different ways. You relate to your old set of values in different ways. Friendships that used to be satisfying sometimes no longer are. You're looking for different things in your friends now. If you have a job, you'll begin to look for different things from your job. And this is the way it should be, because the practice isn't meant just as a type of therapy for people who want to hang on to their lives otherwise, as they always have been. But it's for people who want to stop and take a look at their lives to see what really is important and what's not, and to focus more and more of their time on the areas that really are important, that really deserve top priority. And when you're beginning to ask those questions, you find that the practice begins to make deeper inroads in the mind. It really benefits the mind in ways that it couldn't have otherwise. On a very simple level, just the practice of being mindful as you go through your daily activities. Now, mindfulness here covers both mindfulness and alertness. In other words, having a strong sense of what your frame of reference is as a person practicing meditation. A strong sense that your mind is impacted. Oops, I actually used that word. <laughs> mind is affected not only by what other people do to you, but also by what you do. In fact, most directly by what you do. And so you want to be careful about what you do. Be careful about what you say. And as this becomes a more constant feature of your life, you find that it has an impact on the way you meditate when you're sitting on the cushion here, sitting with your eyes closed. And again, the way you meditate while you're sitting here is going to have an impact on the way you lead your life. The more they help each other along, the stronger both of them will be. In other words, if you can maintain mindfulness, maintain alertness throughout the day, when the time comes to sit down and meditate, the mind is right there. If you let it wander off, it's like a dog that's been put on a long leash. It wanders around, starts wrapping around telephone poles and trees and bushes and benches. And when the time comes to pull it back, it's a long, complicated process to unwind the leash. But if you can keep your mind on a short leash throughout the day, when the time comes to sit down and meditate, here it is, right here, okay, you can get right down to work. And there's a sense of momentum that builds up. At the same time, the stronger your mindfulness as you're meditating, the stronger your alertness, the more solid your concentration. It helps put the mind in a frame of reference where it can look at its life, you can look at your life and really see what's important, what's not important. And as these qualities have been exercised, 
you have a stronger mind to take out with you in, into daily life. So the two, part, the two parts of the practice help each other along. And you begin to notice in certain aspects of your life things that you used to be very casual about. Sometimes you can't be casual, so casual about anymore. Just the way you speak, what you're, the way you express your sense of humor, this is something you really have to be careful about. In America, the number, way, number one way of saying something humorous is basically to lie in a clever way. And that goes right against right speech, so you have to watch out for it. And when you do, you begin to realize that you, you're more in touch with what you say. What you say has more value. And you find other ways that are more helpful ways of expressing your sense of humor. Life as a meditator is not humorless. In fact, the more you begin to see life for what it is, you can't help but be struck by the ironies that riddle life. That's a, and the sense of humor that comes from that sense of irony is something that is, a lot, is worth listening to a lot more than most people's sense of humor. So it's good not only for yourself, but also for the people around you to, stop, to be careful about these things. Look at the people you associate with from the perspective of your meditation. Which ones are helpful? Which ones are harmful? Things we were talking about earlier today. Learn how to be polite but firm in resisting the influence of the harmful people on your own mind. Sometimes you have to hang around with them, or there have to be you have to learn ways of hanging around with them without picking up their attitudes, without picking up their way of looking at things. And how to look for people whose attitudes are more helpful. This may affect your choice of a career, the way you live your life. Well, it's important that you make those choices in light of the meditation. Because the mind is your most important possession. And you want to be able to get through life with, at the very least, with your mind intact, with the good qualities of your mind intact. And at best, you want to lead a life that is actively helpful in improving the state of your mind. So it's not just a question of learning to find time to stick in a little meditation here and stick in a little meditation there so the rest of the life becomes bearable. Meditation should have a pervasive influence on your life. Maybe the word meditation is too narrow. After all, the Pali word for meditation is bhavana, which means to develop, developing good qualities in the mind. And that's something you can do in any context. But you find that some contexts are more conducive than others. So you choose to place yourself in those contexts as, as much as you can. This is what mindfulness means, not just being alert to what's happening, but also keeping in mind the fact what your true priorities are in the practice and looking out for ways to maintain that sense of priorities. So that your life becomes more and more of a peace, more and more at peace as well. Because if your priorities are pulling you in all sorts of different directions, it's very hard to get a sense of how you should live your life. But if your priorities are clear, a lot of the issues in life get cleared up as well. And the mind has a greater and greater sense of well-being, because it's not being pulled in different directions. It's gathered together and going in one very important direction. That's the sign of a life well-lived. <laughs>